if you uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 1, I've been just kind of meditating on different scriptures and God kind of brings things around in my mind. You know, I, I, I realize we live maybe more so than any other time in my lifetime in an age of emotion rather than an age of reason. And you can see it in the news. You can see it when you have people scared to death that the climate is going to create some travesty and we're all going to die in 12 years. You can see it before that, back when I was in college age, there was a big fear that uh, we were going to run out of food, that there was too many people on the earth and we had to figure out how to eliminate people. Uh, and there were books on that and, and uh, awards given to the people who wrote about it. Um, before that, there was a... a the generation before me uh, lived in mortal fear of nuclear war. That uh, in the great schools they did drills and they would duck and duck and cover underneath their chairs and they were always concerned that a nuclear bomb was going to come. And today, uh, you know, uh, and, and then and now, one constant is you know, sort of a fear of other political theories, whatever those other political theories are: um, communism, socialism, thisism, thatism always something to fear, always something to fear. And uh, that's the way people are largely governed by politicians. They try to move the emotions of the people. And, uh, <clears throat> and I, 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 when you look at this verse in uh, or the first chapter of Isaiah, you see God calling out to reason with his people. And if you, uh, I'm not gonna go over all the verses, but in looking at verse four and, and uh, he says, Israel's a sinful nation. They've, they're laden with iniquity, seed of evildoers, evil doers. children. They're corruptors. They have, for, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel into anger. They're gone away backward. And then go, read, jump down to verse 9. It says, except the Lord of hosts had left us unto us a very small remnant, very small, uh, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Said that, you know, the, so God says here, he has a complaint the children of Israel, they're so far gone in the ways of the world, you can't really distinguish them except for a very few between Sodom and Gomorrah, which Sodom and Gomorrah is that city that God rained fire down on and destroyed them all uh, when he pulled Lot and his, his, uh, his family out of there. Uh, and there was a lot of implications of sexual craziness and everything else in that city. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> come now over to, uh, to verse 16, he says, uh, he, he makes a, a, a plea to his people here. He says, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. How has the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment. Righteousness, righteousness lodged in it. But now, murderers. <clears throat> that word reason there is a, a Hebrew word, yakich, which means to, to, to argue, argue in the classical sense, to have a discussion, to have a... Uh, to, to, to debate the right course. And, uh, and it's interesting what the reasoning is about. He's saying uh, the reasoning is that your sins are as scarlet. And, um, and I was thinking about this is something that even the youngest kid can understand. If you think about human nature and what goes through our mind um, and what makes our sins as scarlet, it's everything that opposes God in our mind and in our being. So it's, you think about you know, our anger, our jealousy, our rebellion, our greed. The youngest of the young can understand that. I understood that at a very young age. You know, I'd be angry about this, mad about that, jealous over this. Even the youngest understand that. Later on in life, you get into all sorts of sexual things as well, and it's just, 
man is in in uh, the, the, in the imagination of his mind. It says in another scripture, is is it's altogether opposed to God. It's altogether evil, and and the things that he thinks that are uh, that which dishonors God. I just like the verse that Pastor Chuck just read. That which is wanting cannot be numbered. It's you know you you can't go you could go on and on and on about you know how scarlet are the sins of people of, of every each and every man each and every woman each and every child. Uh, but he says, let us reason together. Though they that's the condition. He says that's the way it is. You shall be white as snow. She will be white as snow, though they be red like crimson, and shall be as wool. What? That's something good to reason about. That's something to sit and think about. What an amazing thing he's talking about here. That, uh, that all that we are, all that we will ever be as humans, as descendants of Adam, our great-great-great-grandfather Adam, it can all be washed away. And you might note it too, is what he says, when he says, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed and everything, he's saying, return to the gospel. Return to the gospel of your salvation, is what he's saying in essence. Um, and uh, cease from your own ways. Cease from your own ways. And you can read the whole chapter. I won't go into that, that chapter. But you see that they'd gotten all into religion and all kinds of madness. And, and they, God couldn't stand what they were up to. They were so religious. <clears throat> so God uh, calls out to his people, let's reason together about this situation. <clears throat> and in our day and age, people have a hard time uh, reasoning because they're in this age of fear and emotion. And now we have the internet coming along and uh, which basically puts emotion on steroids. It, it, it pumps them up, it accentuates, it highlights them. Um, people uh, hide behind this cyber wall and they get to scream and yell at others. And they just vent on it so much so that they really almost lose control of themselves. That they, can't, they can't even reason anymore. Unless you're uh, on their side or saying what they want to hear, they can only scream, and that's the sad condition of the world we live in. And I want to I want to address this you know this issue. And first, I want to make the point that when dealing with people, when maybe when dealing with our with those around us uh, in particular, and even those that in our church in our midst, there's a concept in Proverbs 15:1. You can turn there. We'll go go through several things in Proverbs, but. In Proverbs 51, it says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up this anger and this emotion. Turn to, I want to turn to 2 Kings. I'm going to show an example of this. It's the sweetest, to me, it's a very sweet story. And it kind of shows how men are, hearing the gospel can just get riled up about it. They can get angry about it. Throw a fit. So what do you do when you see that in your world? What you do when you see others going through this. In 2 Kings 5, there's the story of Naaman the Syrian. <clears throat> and um, I'll start in verse 9. It says, uh, Naaman came with, now Naaman had leprosy. So that was obviously a big problem. And he heard that there was someone in Israel that could do something about it. And uh, his king sent to the king of Israel and said, hey, can you fix this? And the king was what can I, am I God? I can't do that. But then someone told the king, hey, there's uh, there's this prophet, Elijah, that, uh, that's, that's who he needs to see. So Naaman takes off to see Elijah. And by the way, he takes off, it doesn't, I didn't cut this part of the verse out, but he took tons of gold and clothes and he was there just to, ready to pay for anything. Money was no object. He was wanting this leprosy gone. So in 2 Kings 5 and verse 9, we pick it up. Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. <laughs> but Naaman was wroth <clears throat> and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. He's looking for an emotional experience. He's looking for something outside of the Word of God. He wants he wants to be pumped up. He wants magic. Um, just like when, uh, just uh, uh, we'll get to, get to this in a second, just like uh, Herod, when he saw Jesus, he was like, I want to see, I want to see a trick and turn water into wine, do something. I've heard about it. No interest in the truth, just I want to see the magic. So uh, Naaman <clears throat> 
says uh, he thought he'd strike his hand over the place and recover the lep from the leprosy. And he goes, aren't, are not Arbana and Parfar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? I assume by that he means they're cleaner, fresher, what have you. Maybe in the certain areas and nice, better if he's got this clean in the water. May, not, may I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went away in a rage. And uh, here's the beautiful part. And this is the soft answer that, that can help a soul that's in turmoil and emotion. And a servant came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean. <laughs> what, what beautiful advice. Just hear the message and obey. And uh, so he, the, by, by the grace of God, Naaman hears it. He hears that soft answer. He, then he went down. He dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there's no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But he, that's Elisha, said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. This isn't about money. It's not about what you're buying. I don't think Naaman was meaning that or meaning it in a bad way, but but he uh, uh, he urged him to take it, but, but he refused. And you can go on from there in, in the story. But the point is how sometimes a soft answer in our emotion-driven era, just, uh, it's a simple story. Let's reason together. What saith the Lord? What saith the Lord? Some refuse to hear. Turn to Acts. I've got a couple of verses in Acts. Some simply just can't hear. They couldn't hear back then. They won't hear now. Acts chapter 7. You've run into people like this, I assume. Maybe some of you have. I know I have. Stephen was preaching. Um, and uh, telling the whole long, uh, long exposition on the gospel. And um, those around him uh, were fixing to throw rocks at him, kill him, stone him. And uh, in verse 56, Stephen says, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. It's because they were going to stone him. And uh, when, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Sometimes people just stop their ears. That's it. I don't, I don't, they refuse to hear. They absolutely refuse to hear. Turn to Acts 22, 22. You see the same thing. And they, can, they can take it a step further. Of course, they did take it a step further. They ran upon him. I don't think they were there to give him a loving hug. They're there to hurt him. In Acts 22, 2, uh, 22, 22, we see the same thing for Paul. Uh, and they gave him audience under, under this word and then lifted up their voices after Paul was preaching and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it's not fit that he should live. And uh, the chief captain came and rescued Paul. Uh, otherwise, he would have been uh, gone right then and there. So uh, the point I'm making here, you know, in dealing with people and reasoning with people about this, this scripture and reasoning about sins that are red as crimson, a soft answer, some, but it works with some, some simply refuse to hear. Turn to Proverbs. Uh, they refuse to hear, and when they refuse to hear, it's almost well, always as far as I can tell, because they prefer a different message. They prefer a different message. In Proverbs 14 and verse 7, You're counseled by the Lord to go from the presence of a foolish man. It means get away. Just move out, move aside. Let them have their room. Go from the presence of a foolish man 
when you perceive not in him the lips of knowledge. Now, how are you going to know that he doesn't have the lips of knowledge? You're going to know when he, he or she starts speaking what it is that they believe. Um, in Proverbs, you don't need to turn there, but in Proverbs 19, 27, the Lord counsels to, to cease to hear the instruction that causes the error from the words of knowledge. So, so um, they prefer a, a, a different message. And when you perceive that to be the case, that uh, what comes out of their mouth is, I prefer my God over here. Just go. Go. It's time to move on. I'll show this in other places as well. Turn to Esther chapter 3. I'm going to show you an interesting example of what drives these people when they hear the gospel and want, want their own way. To give you a little background, the story of Esther who uh, became queen to Ahasuerus, and Ahasuerus had a second-in-command named Haman. And Haman, for those of you who may not recall, but uh, Haman was the, the early version of Hitler. He, he hated the Jews, and he wanted uh, to, uh, to have them all put to death. And uh, the beginning of that root of hatred uh, is in Esther 3 in verse 5, where it says, When Haman saw that Mordecai, Mordecai, which was the uncle of Esther, didn't bow to him, bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath, and he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. Now, the point here, where it says he thought this, he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai, that word for scorn is a Hebrew word that means extreme contempt, a disdain which springs from a person's opinion of the meanness of the object. Uh, or a consciousness or belief of his own superiority or worth. Here was Mordecai, faithful to the gospel, faithful to the king, and, and Haman wouldn't have it, couldn't stand it, that he wasn't bowing to him, bowing to his way, bowing to his thinking, bowing to his, his idea of, uh, of, of a gospel. And uh, he was scornful. So I'm just, the point I'm making here, the point for is uh, those, there are people, some who just stop their ears, others who s make it very specific. Their preference is for their God and they, they, they uh, show scorn towards those who believe the gospel because they prefer their own opinion. They strongly prefer their own opinion and, and uh, uh, it angers them and brings out their wrath and that's uh, that's the way it is. You can see that throughout the whole New Testament. It's not a new not a new story there. The point uh, point uh, five is they they ever object that their their one of their key complaints is that God isn't fair. Turn to Ezekiel. You can see this in a couple different places. They demand that God bow to their idea of fairness, and they accuse God of. They accuse God of being unfair. When they hear the gospel, they cannot stand that they don't get their way, that God doesn't bow to them. Just like Mordecai didn't bow to Haman, they hate it that the gospel, those who preach the gospel won't bow to their thinking and that God won't bow to them. In Ezekiel 33, and that whole chapter is really about God dealing with, again, with rebellion amongst, the, amongst Israel. And uh, uh, God speaking to uh, Ezekiel about how to, uh, to, to warn the people and, and so on and so forth. But in, in verse 17, he says, uh, uh, this is the complaint that the people were making to the preacher. Yet the children of thy people say, the way of the Lord is not equal. 
But as for them, their way isn't equal. equal. So their complaint against God was, it, it's not fair. You have to, God has to give them their chance. God has to give them, God has to bow to their will. It's as simple as that. You see that in Romans 2. Uh, in Paul, turn to Romans 9. When you strip it down and you think about those that, that walk away, at the end of the day, they'll not have this man to reign over them. It's as simple as that. That's the way it was put in the New Testament. <clears throat> they'll not have this man to reign over them. In, uh, in Romans 9, and verse 19, Paul says, Thou, you'll say unto me, why does he, that's why does God yet find fault? Because he, he loved Esau and hated Jacob. Uh, and why does he find fault? For who has resisted his will? Basically saying, if God puts everything in motion, then he's at fault. If God is, a, is, is ruler and king and, and sovereign potentate, then how is it that he can complain about anything? And the, the God's re response to that is, Nay, but, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why have you made me thus? It's just simply one of those things where God says, uh, that is not an adequate argument against his sovereign power, will, and authority. He's, uh, it's in his hand to do as he will, and yet men that rebel and walk away are 100% guilty. 100% guilty. Um, if you, you know, I'm going off the top of my, my head here, but in Acts, when Peter was preaching in the very first sermon, he said, God, by the, by the determined foreknowledge, had Christ go to the cross and offer himself up for his people. But you, but you by wicked hands, have, have slain and crucified him. So even though it was God had determined that Christ must die on behalf of his people, it did not absolve those people of guilt. It did not. The same thing still today. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. So how to handle the scornful, how to handle the those that uh, insist on their foolishness. A couple of verses on that. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 6, Jesus' counsel was this. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Uh, they, those that, that hate the gospel, when you hear not the lips of knowledge, and uh, they start uh, promoting their instruction that causes you to err from the words of knowledge, and they start saying, this is, you know, I've got a better way, and so forth. The advice of Christ is, you know, move away, because they are going to—they're going to try to destroy you next. Don't get in, you know. Like I said, go from the presence of the foolish man. Here he says, uh, don't, don't, uh, don't give give that which is holy unto dogs. Turn to uh, Matthew chapter ten. It says says it pretty much again. There's a warning to us on how far to go. With people, uh, it's right, it's good that we share the gospel with every, every person. Uh, certainly all those that ask, uh, to give them a reason of the hope that's in, in us. That's right and perfect and good. How they respond, you should watch. You should watch, you should listen, and see how what God is doing in them. And In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 11, Jesus said, Into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide, Till you go thence, till you leave, and when you come into a and when you come into a, an house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust off your feet, shake it off. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. 
And uh, you know, it's in the scripture says, we're the, we're the savor of life, un, life unto life and the savor of death unto death. Those that won't hear the gospel message as we share it with them, uh, that's, a, that's, that's, that's death unto death. It says it's gonna be more tolerable for, for them, uh, for Sodom and more than them in judgment. So saith Christ. But how to handle all, all the others, you know, that, that, that's the, all that's kind of the hard part of life and the sad part. Those that prefer their God over the Christ of Scripture and the true and living God. That's the hard part of life. Turn to First Peter 3. And it can be easy, easy to be overwhelmed from time to time. Just like if you think in Isaiah's day, we're not alone. In Isaiah's day, what was in the city, what was in the nation of Israel? A very small remnant. This is not a new experience in, in, in life that a very small remnant is holding to the gospel. And that's a fact. In 1 Peter 3, and verse 14, says, but, but and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. With meekness and fear. So uh, how to handle all others? Well, be ready to give an answer with meekness and fear, the reason of the hope. That's a good thing. Turn to... Um, uh, Mark chapter 12 now, I'm gonna uh, this to me this is a, a sweet a, a sweet story it's a it's not a complete story but Jesus is um, dealing with the Pharisees. And uh, the Pharisees are trying to trip him up as they usually do. And um, one of them asks in verse 28, which is the first commandment of all, trying to paint Jesus into a corner that will somehow they could take advantage of it. And, and Jesus says, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the the heart and with all the understanding with all the soul and all the strength and to love his neighbor as himself is more than the all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly <clears throat> he said unto him thou art not far from the kingdom of God and no man durst after that durst ask any questions but there was to me that's a this man is coming to a realization so uh, in terms of dealing with the, the, those that hear the gospel, this man's coming to a realization. And he's not there yet. He doesn't fully understand, but Jesus encourages him. He says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Is he there now? No. He's in the midst of a pack of rebels. But he realized all of a sudden a light's going off in this man's mind. That, that this, uh, uh, that, that this, you know, that, Obedience to the to the word is more than all this other stuff, all these other pictures and shadows. Um, I have a quote here. I, I can't even remember who I got it from. I've got it in your uh, handout there. Uh, but when Jesus saw whether this scribe made any farther progress is uncertain, but as he had shown himself to be teachable, Christ stretches out the hand to him and teaches us by his example that we ought to assist those in whom there is any beginning either of docility or of right understanding. There appear to have been two reasons why Christ declared that this scribe was not far from the kingdom of God. It was because he was easily persuaded to do his duty and became, and <clears throat> because he 
skillfully distinguished the outward worship of God from necessary duties. Nor was it so much with the design of praising as of exhorting him that Christ declared that he was near the kingdom of God. And in his person, Christ encourages us, encourages us all after having once entered into the right path to proceed with so much the greater cheerfulness. But these words are also are also taught that many, while this is a thing I want to point out, while they are while they are still held and involved in air, advance with closed eyes toward the road in this manner are prepared for running in the course of the Lord when the time arrives. This is the beginning of revelation to this fellow. It reminds me of the the fellow that uh, that Jesus healed, and then the crowd whisked him away, and the man never knew really what happened. He knew something really unusual had happened because he was healed. And the, the Pharisees put him, hauled him before the court and said, what happened to you? And they asked him over and over and over again. And he began to reason, reason about what just had happened, that this event, the fact that he was blind, this had never happened before, ever in the history of the world. And he began to defend Jesus, and they got very upset with him. But, but Jesus came back, Jesus made a point to come back around to him. And so it is, you know, when, 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 some, when God starts to revealing himself to a man, he keeps revealing. He keeps revealing. We don't know what happened to this scribe, but God's revealing himself. And that's probably a safe bet he kept revealing. Turn to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> Happily, there are other responses. Even in, in a various, amongst a very small remnant. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, it says, Then they, they, this is a different response. They that gladly received his word. They that gladly received his word. What a happy response that is. They, they, they were baptized the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. Wow, that's a magnificent thing. Gladly receiving the word. Some, uh, their revelation is in small steps. Some just, that's what they, that's what they've been seeking. Uh, turn to Acts chapter 16. And I'll close with this. In Acts 16 and verse 30, Paul speaking to the Philippian jailer. The jailer bring, brings them out. It says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? There's another reaction to the hearing of the gospel. What must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and, they ho and thy house. And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. So, to bring this around, to a conclusion. One, reasoning from the scriptures is a good thing. It's a good thing for every soul. Though your sins be as scarlet, they, they can be white. white. No, uh, I, I like that verse in Acts where it says, you know, Christ came and, and, and to, 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 I'm just going to paraphrase here, remove from you all, all that the law couldn't do. Everything that, that, that you couldn't you couldn't bear. Uh, God has placed all of the the guilt and the burden on His Son on the on the cross of Calvary uh, for for those sinners He came to die for. So reasoning from the Scripture is a good thing. And second, that you know, soft answers can help us deal with the people around us who are going. You know, who first hear this, and uh, and by nature they may strike out or in wrath and and so forth. But when they continue to refuse to hear and they, they start to promote their their own way over God's, they start to, you can see them hardening and turning and going their direction. And they object to an unfair God. They prefer their message. They scorn those that believe. There's direction there for the believer. And that direction is shake the dust, wipe the dust off your feet, go. Yes, it's like, okay, I, I'm, I'm, I've, had, I've had my fill. You, you have, uh, your direction is becoming apparent. But the good news is, is that it also, in our life experience, we're going to find those that are going to, they're going to say, you know, that's something special. Uh, I, I, that's, that's meaningful. There are going to be those that are going to gladly hear the word and say, 
that's that's it. That's that's my hope. That's my hope that when he died, he died for me. And they're going to follow. They're going to get. They're going to follow in baptism, and they're going to continue on in fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers, and they're going to continue on all their days. So I say, listen carefully to those around you. Uh, listen carefully when they respond to the word, because that word is. It's it's our hope. It's their hope that uh, that that Christ, when he came down from heaven, he came to save sinners. As Paul said, of whom I am chief. I like to debate that because I think that I am, but uh, some people say it's not fair. If it's in the scripture, he must really be the chief of sinners. Well, then I'm second. So, and, and but our hope lies in the fact that that though, and here's the reasonable thing, that, that though my sins be as scarlet, they can be white as snow, and they're made white as snow by the work of another, not by me.